Okay, continuing now with our tips and strategies for Mr. Madison's War, the Incredible War of 1812. And in this video I'll show you some strategies for the second half of 1812 uh, and the beginning of 1813. Okay, in part one I had mentioned how the British have got to um, secure the St. Lawrence supply line here to Quebec. It's very critical that they keep that open because it's very vulnerable to American attacks out of Sackett's Harbor. And uh, I'm going to show you some tips and tactics for securing that line. Now one move that should be self-evident is uh, Prevost up here at Quebec. Now, he's got with him three good regiments. And it only takes a two card to activate Prevost. And a very simple move is to move Prevost down the St. Lawrence very early on in the game. Quebec virtually is impregnable in 1812. There's no way an American army is going to get up that far. At best, Montreal, and even then, that's pushing, pushing the envelope. So by using a two card, Prevost can move these regiments downriver, like so, and picking up the Glengarry Regiment, which is an A-class unit at Trois Rivières at the same time. So he can go one, two, three, four, five, six. He can be as far as Long Sioux, and he himself, since he's got ten movement points, could actually move back seven, eight, nine back to Montreal. But for now, we'll keep him with the troops at Long Sioux. Now, of course, that would mean that next turn, he'd have to burn up another two card. Let's see. The British are fortunate enough to get the death of Isaac Brock. And then he can move down the St. Lawrence once again, dropping off units at the spots that can be hit by the Americans. And now your St. Lawrence line is rather secure. If you want to be really protective, you could actually drop a unit up here at Chrysler's Farm also. And again, Prevost can move back to any one of these locations. So it would take two cards, and the St. Lawrence River line is fairly secure then. And you may remember that in the last video, I showed how it's very vulnerable to American attacks out of Ch Sachs Harbor, especially when Chauncey gets his fleet. Once Chauncey gets his fleet in the second half of 1812, all along Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River is vulnerable. Now I'm going to show um, a tactic or something to watch out for to start um, chipping away at American naval power in 1812. Now one tactic both players should be aware of are these cards that destroy enemy naval vessels. Now they're usually only one cards and they at first appear to be very subtle, like lake vessel destroyed may remove one enemy schooner or sloop permanently from the game. Well, it doesn't sound like much, removing one schooner, but I can assure you that the removal of one schooner can have long-term effects. So don't ignore these cards. Chipping away at the enemy's naval strength, bit by bit, will pay off in the long run. Especially for the British. If the British can get the chance to reduce Chauncey's fleet by even one schooner, I'd recommend to do so. It's a very good card. It's only a one, and it has good long-term effects. Now another sneaky way for the British to chip away at American naval power is to take advantage of Rule 14.42, um, which is naval reinforcements. Now, Chauncey gets the schooners Hamilton and Julia, which appear suddenly on the board in the second half of 1812. That's a given. Those are the only naval reinforcements that come directly on the board. But, by the provisions of Rule 14.42, if the British occupy the town of Ogdensburg when those units are to appear, the American does not get them. So that's two schooners you can chip off right away if you're fortunate enough to take Ogdensburg. Now, if you do it too early in the... Um, the year, you might tip off the American and of course you'll try to take Augsburg back. But sometimes a little sneaky move is to take it on your last card of the first half of 1812. By that time the American might have forgotten about it or has uh, been too busy with other things. But again, two schooners is not to be um, laughed at. Um, that can make a big difference in the long term of the game. Now one move that would appear to be obvious at first for Americans is to activate Dearborn at Albany. 
So it has the main eastern army. But that has some um, disadvantages also. For one, it takes a three card to activate Dearborn, which is a bit expensive. Now, on the advantage side, side, he can make it up to Plattsburgh pretty quick. One, two, three, four, five, six. And there you're up at Plattsburgh with a very formidable army. You're threatening the British um, south of Montreal, which is always good. And a lot of historians have criticized the American strategy for not going right for the juggler as they did in the revolution. But this has a lot of disadvantages uh, also, and I'll explain why. For one, if the American shows their hand too early, they move a major force here to Plattsburgh, it's quite easy for Prevost up at Quebec to counter that move as I showed before earlier. He can easily move forces down from Quebec, south of Montreal, and block the passage. So you're going to more or less have a big, at best maybe a one-to-one -one with some British A-class units in there. It could be a minus one. They've got forced for defense. Montreal is not going to be taken in 1812, or it's highly unlikely. Now, one can make the case, well, if they do that, they're not protecting the St. Lawrence River line. True. But, on the other hand, Sackett's Harbor itself is also wide open, because it's only protected here by the New York militia, later on by Forsyth's A-class rifles, which is a crack unit. So moving the Eastern Army up to Plattsburgh, I don't know if it's a recommended move or not. I, I It kind of leads to a stalemate. So what Dearborn often has to do, or what the American player has to do, is often move single units with low cards. Let's say he's got um, a one card to play. He can move one single unit up to uh, Sackett's Harbor in no time at all. One, two, three, four, five. And he can continue to use low value cards if he's got them to move single units up to protect his um, fronts on the east. So I've seen both strategies um, utilized and they each have their advantages and disadvantages. But I only mentioned Dearborn um, because I think many people are inclined to move him directly to Plattsburgh and I don't think that is the best move. The American forces that start 1812 are not very good. Sackett's Harbor is a major base, you want to protect that. And the Niagara is a little on the thin side too. And we'll get to that in a moment. Now when you get right down to it, the Americans in 1812 have got to be patient. Because Americans uh, did not make their major push until 1813. Their army wasn't fully recruited, it wasn't ready. So if the American happens to get these naval cards in his hand, a good strategy is to play them, if you can. I mean, after all, there's two, four, six, there's eight points in naval cards right there, if you're fortunate to get them, and the British is not keeping it busy enough that uh, you don't have to use them for something else. Another good card here is this cutting out of the Caledonia. Caledonia is a British uh, supply schooner way up here at um, uh, Fort St. George, uh, St. Joseph. And if you knock out that schooner, it's very unlikely the British will be able to reinforce the fort very easily or attack Mackinac. So the Americans should always be aware of these naval cards that he's got in his hand. Now, the unfortunate part is they happen to be threes, and that's the decision-making I want people to be aware of in the game. Do you use this three to move troops on the board, or just play it for uh, two straight points? And of course, when you do play it, you put them over here on the side. So for 1812, the Americans have got to play a patient game. They can't win the war in 1812. It's just not possible. So they have to play and look ahead to 1813. The British, on the other hand, should be trying to keep the Americans off balance as much as they can. So let's take a look at some of the cards and uh, events that can occur in 1813. Okay, now we're looking at the Niagara Front. And this is a typical uh, situation by 1813. If the British haven't uh, muffed it up, they've usually secured that line. And if the Americans haven't muffed it up, they've usually um, got a secure defense there too. And it's very hard for either side to successfully invade across the Niagara. 
Now, the British have the two forts, Fort George and Fort Erie. The Americans have the single fort, Fort Niagara. Now, the weak spot in here is actually Buffalo. Buffalo is not fortified, and uh, it is one of the naval bases by 1813, too, as is Erie down here. So, it's very hard for either side to gain decisive victory on the Niagara, as it was historically. What happened historically was, um, like for example, the Americans later took Fort Erie in 1814, the British retreated up here, the uh, Americans advanced, and the British could always fall back on their supply line. And vice versa would occur too. The British, when they took uh, Fort Niagara in 1814, found the same thing. Once you take it, the Americans fall back on their resources, and it's just kind of like trading queens almost. It's a tough nut to crack. Not an easy front to crack. You practically need naval power on Lake Ontario or Lake Erie to break the deadlock. So that's typical. Now, if Brock has survived 1812, he's also one of the best British commanders with a plus two. So, if the Niagara frontier gets stalemated, um, don't be too worried about it. That's often uh, what happens. Not to say that the situation can't be opened up. It can, you know, by various cards, like the Lower Sea Cord card or the night attack at Stony Creek can often uh, break a deadlock. So, um, not a lot of advice I can give you for 1813 on the Niagara front, except that it's a very hard front to exploit. What the Americans usually want to do is sort of come up the rear through the Detroit, Thames Valley area, they can. Now, a critical space for the British on this front, though, is Burlington. That's right here. Burlington, Upper Canada, as opposed to Burlington, Vermont. Now, Burlington is very critical because that spot practically is the supply line for all the West. The British never want to lose Burlington, so it's always a good idea to keep a, a unit uh, in uh -huh. there. If you don't, and the Americans get naval superiority, remember they've got Chauncey, it's not much of a stretch for Chauncey to use his fleet to land a unit in the British rear here. And um, if he does that, the British are in big trouble. For this example, Americans would be in control of Lake Ontario for two points. They would have landed an infantry unit here at Burlington for two points, a total of four. And they're also cutting off the entire British right division. So Burlington, critical spot. You don't want to lose it. And it isn't for fortified, just like Buffalo is not fortified. So that's some uh, things to watch out for on the Niagara front. Okay, a few cards to watch out for that come up in 1813 and don't exist in the 1812 deck is the Heavy Rains card. The Heavy Rains card and the Contrary Winds card are those typical um, screw the other guy cards. And they can do a lot of damage. They can really wreck up a guy's campaign. Especially if he's moved a large army for an attack. Throw the heavy rains card on him. And that forces only moving a squint one square. Same thing for a naval battle. He might sally his whole fleet to do battle with you, to destroy you. Throw the contrary winds card on him. And he has to stay in port. Um, the incendiary action card, there's only a couple of these I think. Um, that's a controversial card. I had a couple of questions about it in the game. The incendiary action card, well, you'd only want to use this under dire circumstances, you might say. It's used to destroy enemy towns. I mean enemy as in original territory. So Buffalo is always enemy to the British. Fort Erie is always enemy to the Americans. So let's say, for example, the British were over here at Buffalo and they were comfortably getting four points but they saw that they couldn't hold it they, either American forces were close by and they decided no we can't hold it if they had the incendiary action card they could play it and get two points um, instead of the four now what it does do though is destroy the town just flattens it and um, making it no good for the Americans for winter quarters. So that's why you would do it. Instead of uh, losing four points by just evacuating it, you'd at least get two points. So that's the reason for using the card. 
but uh, doing that kind of thing can maybe enrage your opponent and he may pull the same thing on you and if he gets Fort George or some other town so you want to think about that card before using it is it better to just take two points now or maybe you'd be able to get Buffalo back and get four points so a little bit of a decision there there are not too many incendiary action cards in the game and that was intentional it's because um, it just wasn't the norm in the War of 1812. In fact, the uh, American leader who burnt the town of Newark was later court-martialed and cashiered from service. Uh, the British retaliated by burning Buffalo later, and there's a uh, burning of Buffalo card in there, I think. Or, I know, actually. Another card, a good one, is uh, the signal error. Remember I told you about chipping away at American naval power? Well, this is a British card, and it can be used in a battle where there's at least four vessels per side. It's going to be a fairly large battle. But after the battle, or during the battle, you can play this card, and um, the American has to lose two more schooners, and that can be very decisive. So the signal error card is another powerful card to watch out for in 1813. Now, of course, like in most card-driven games, one of the most powerful cards in the game is the campaign card. A lot of games have this, like Washington's War and a few others. The campaign card is the only one that allows you to move two leaders. Um, so it's a very powerful card and there's several of those in the deck. Okay, I want to keep these videos short, so I'll just give some general comments for the Americans and British in 1813. Now, as I mentioned, in 1812, the Americans are going to be hard-pressed to get points. It's possible they've got to just kind of hold their own and wait till their power comes in. And that occurs in the winter of 1812-1813, when Harrison's army comes in here at Fort MacArthur. Generally, the Americans are going to want to push into western Upper Canada, try to isolate Fort Malden if they can, and if they can, occupy the Thames Valley and get as many points as they can. And... Uh, Perry and his fleet will want to take control of Lake Erie for sure. If they can, also take control of Lake uh, Huron. So the Americans in 1813 have got to make their big push. That's got to be the surge. They've got to take points in the west, take the lakes, be as aggressive as they can in 1813 because they've got to get ahead in points. You want that victory point track up in your favor. You know, plus 10 would be nice, but you want it, you want it up here. You really have to make your big surge in 1813. Because in 1814, we know that huge British reinforcements are coming in here at Quebec. And the British will be coming back like a bull in a china shop. So uh, that's general American strategy for 1813. Make your big push, get as many points as possible. For the British, well, that's obvious. Hold on as much as you can, deny as many American points as possible. The, Mer the British do get reinforcements in 1813 up here at Quebec but having played the British many times Quebec is a long way from Upper Canada it takes a long time for those reinforcements to get to Upper Canada Western Upper Canada yes they can go down here in the Lake Champlain front but usually if the American is doing his job enough well enough he's keeping the British pretty busy on these fronts and these reinforcements have to come down so the British, 1813, is going to be a tough year. You've got to hold on as much as possible. In our last video, I'll uh, show you a bit of strategies for 1814 and maybe get a little bit uh, into the naval combat. Hope you enjoyed the video.